No matter how many times we have it on the overhead, I'm always going to encourage you to bring your Bible. If you need something to write. I know some of you use your phones and, and uh, uh, your iPads or whatever you have, but you just can't mark in them like you can a Bible. Take notes if you would. Miss Linda? Go ahead. Oh, she got another one. You know how many birthdays she's had since I've been around? How old is she? Seventy-seven. Miss Miss Hicks, we bless you today. Yeah. Mom and Sister Hicks been with me. Uh, Brother Hicks been with me twenty some years. Amen. Been very faithful. They helped way back in the day build this church. Their children were married in this church, and then we turned around and bought it and remodeled it. So a lot of heritage there, a lot of good things. I've been preaching on connection. Everybody say connection. I mean, connection is such a powerful word. And, uh, and, and if you will start paying attention, and you have to pay attention to the connections in your life and how that you connect. La- uh, a week ago, we talked about uh, Mary and Elizabeth making the connection. A young 15, 16 year old girl who was a virgin that was with child and an elderly lady, probably in her 70s and 80s, who was barren and had a child. Both miracles. And yet when they got together, the baby didn't just jump in the womb, the baby leaped. That means going from one place to the other. There's something about when you find a divine connection that makes the baby inside you jump. Amen. You know when you found those kind of people. They, 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 they do something to you, they re- revitalize you, if you would. And now, when it comes to this, I want to use the word initiative. Everybody say initiative. The word initiative is the catalyst. It takes action, springs from self-motivation, self-starters. And this is the thing about, uh, it it means to begin things. It's hard as a uh, parent to help your kids have initiative. It is. Some some just naturally catch it. Others, you got to... You got to help them get started. In other words, they just don't make their bed on their own. They just don't carry out the trash on their own. You got to help motivate them. And then as an adult, you got to keep the initiative. You got to keep moving. Well, I believe in taking the initiative to reconnect. It's something about connecting with people. I went to a ball game Friday night. I was sitting at the house. I thought, why sit you here? Y'all with me? Why sit you here? And when there's a ball game going on over there. So I jumped on my scooter because that's the easiest way in and out of a ball game or a hospital. Even I parked right there real quick, right up front. I went inside. I got there and I met some folk and said, howdy, hi. You know, and these new stadiums are incredible. Uh, if, you, if you saw where I came from, it's a cow pasture. They're still playing football on it in here, but these new stadiums are like NFL fields where teams actually win. Uh, so there, uh, I got there and I hugged some necks and greeted some people. And I didn't go to watch the game, basically. I went to connect. That's why I go to places like that. So I, I went, and a man grabbed me, touched me on the shoulder. He said, uh, he said, how you doing, Pastor? And I hadn't seen this man about six months. And as soon as I saw him, I remember the last time he wasn't doing so good. Now he's doing good. I could tell in his eyes, everything about him told me this man has got his stuff together now. And he said to me, he said, would you like to go up into the press box? And I was sweating like I am right now, standing out there, and it was a little hot Friday night. And I said, excuse me? He said, do you want to go upstairs? And I said, why, sure. So we got in an elevator and went all the way up to the top. And I'm overlooking in an air-conditioned room that's got cookies and milk and, 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 and ice cream and free sodas and, and, and chicken and, and all kind of stuff spread out. And I'm thinking, this has got to be heaven. I mean, I'm just telling you, I went from the, from the gutter to the udder. I went straight up there. And I'm thinking, this is good. Everybody say connections. Connections are so powerful, man. I mean, when you make connections. So I'm up there in the press box. And when I get there, this little lady looks at me and she said you're pastor jerry aren't you i said yes ma'am she said do you know me and i said i i, I don't i don't remember hey, it's a good answer you just get your answer and she said 11 years ago i had kidney failure and i was dying and my daughter came to your church and she came up front she said would you pray for my mama and you took off your bandana and you stuck it in her hand and you prayed that my kidneys would recover, and she was having a transplant, and everything would work out. 
She said, Pastor, that was 11 years ago. I kept that bandana. I pray. Now, listen, there's no power in the bandana. How many know that? The power's in the prayer and praying and believing. But every time she saw that bandana, she knew somebody prayed for you. She said, I've been wanting to meet you. So here I was on, in, the, in the press box meeting a lady who just got a kidney 11 years ago and still doing well. <laughs> See, life is about connection. Now, what's important is, are you comfortable? You need to get comfortable right now because it ain't going to get any easier. There are times preaching the Word of God is, uh, uh, becomes a warning. And a lot of our churches, they, uh, we don't, we don't want to warn, and those who do warn are often mean about it. And, and one of the scriptures I remember when I got born again, Trey, was this scripture here that motivated me. It affected me because it came through the disciple Peter, who was a man who understood what it would be like to live one night without Jesus. One night. One night he betrayed him. One night he denied him. I mean, one night. And it affected Peter. In Second Peter, he wrote this. Chapter 2, verse 20. For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is being born again, giving your life to him, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now here comes sobriety. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. When I read this, uh, I get spiritual chills because I understand the, uh, the brevity of life, how short life is, and the severity of once knowing God and then turning you back on it. Amen. And Peter said, let me just tell you, I spent one night wallowing in the mud. I spent one night like a dog going back to his vomit. And it's not a good thing. Now, in my life, what I've noticed is there are degrees in which one seems to slide back. In other words, we, when we get born again, how many know there are degrees we can go up? Line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. I mean, th sometimes life in the kingdom just gets better and better and better, man. It just, it can't get no better than this. And all of a sudden you have a grandchild, oh and it just gets better and better. It just keeps on growing. God blesses you and favors you. But then if you start going the other direction, well, all of a sudden you're an unchurched believer. And that, that's, that's, that's okay, because I, I meet a lot of unchurched believers. My heart is after unchurched believers. Always has been. I want to find those that don't have a church and get them connected. I just love the church like Jesus loved the church. He died for the church. But then after being an unchurched believer, if you're not careful, that old word, it almost sounds mean to say it, you start backsliding. Sliding back. And a man or a woman without a future always reverts back to their past. And if you don't have a future to keep elevating into, you'll go back to the gutter in which you came from. Matter of fact, let me say it like this. It'll get worse. You thought you had a drinking problem? Slip back from God. You thought you had a drug problem? Slip back from God. You thought you gossiped then? Wait till you leave. Now you got something to gossip about. The whole church. It'll just get worse and worse and worse. So here's the stopping point this morning. Can I get an Amen. Can I put a little stop on? But not only that, not to just you. We got to reach people. We got to we got to take initiative to go after people. Then my job, if I have one, is to mature you to do the work of the ministry. And when we started these connect groups, we had a tremendous time out at the Burgesses shooting skeet the other night. Man, it was great. And we had new guys join in. We had some of your employees join in. They just and they connected with us. It was so easy to connect. We we got uh, today after the second service, we got a bike ride and a meeting together. Excited about that. But there's opportunities to connect with new people and to go after people that thought maybe the church was was not relevant for them. I'm telling you, it'll never not be relevant. We need a house. We need a home. We need a body. Can I get an amen? Watch this. Stay standing just for a minute. Stay. I want you to be a little bit uncomfortable. According to the Barna group, and this is a group that I follow, they really do a lot of uh, statistical work in the, in the churches. Only 3 out of 10 Americans are church attenders. That's 30%. 30% of people in America, and this is what I'm called to, is America, uh, attend the house of God. Of the remaining seven who are not in church, four used to attend church. 
We call those dropout believers. I'd call them unchurched believers. I'm uh, praying to God they don't just go ahead and slide off. They have disconnected themselves from any meaningful relationship with the church. They still profess a degree of belief in Jesus Christ, but for the most part, their love has grown cold. We have now reached a tipping point in America. There are more dropout believers than there are those who actively are engaged in the church today. If all of the dropout believers in the U.S. were restored to the church, the church would double in size, which means we wouldn't be ready for them. But I say we got to get ready. Amen. As long as I'm alive I just, and, and preaching the gospel, I just want to be ready for this because I've seen it happen before. I believe it'll happen again. Father, I thank you for your love for the house. I thank you for your love for your people. God, there's, there's in no way casting stones to anyone, but God, believing in the name of Jesus that we'll rise up and move to new levels in you. In Jesus' name. And everyone sit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you today. Mm-hmm. He's not talking about me. He's talking about you. Imagine, imagine a Sunday service where the level of attendance uh, begins to just start climbing because the, the unchurched starts coming back in. The stats are just as bad or worse in Canada. They're worse than that in Western Europe. This problem is, is unique in the Western, is not unique in the Western Hemisphere. Outside the West, the church has problems, but mostly involved in persecution, not apathy. Most churches in, in other parts of the world are going through persecution. We're not. We're going through apathy. Sure, a Democrat or somebody said something that hurts your feelings. Get over it. Amen. A Republican said something that bothered you about your taxes. Get over it. We're not being persecuted. But we do have apathy. We do have, we have just set back. Drop out believers everywhere. We all know some. Some are family members, friends, neighbors, work associates, and the rest are strangers whom we encounter almost every day. And I, for one, believe in, an unchurch, in unchurched believers. My heart aches for them. I know what it can be like when you get connected to the church. And this falling away phenomenon was, was prophesied in the Word of God. It was going to happen, but it doesn't mean I have to stand around and like it. I don't have to like people I've loved falling out of the house of God, falling away from Jesus, going back to the mud, going back to their vomit. I don't have to like it. So even if it says it's going to happen, I can still go after those because I believe in a last day's resurge of the bride of Christ. Something good is going to happen. Again, this, this post-Christian age that we're living in has greatly exasperated our culture, our societal problems. For the most part, dropouts buy into the, the secular culture of today. This is a problem. They buy into it. They buy into what they see on Hollywood. They buy into what they hear coming out of California. They buy into all the little uh, 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 sexual innuendos that you hear. They just buy into it. They, they, we got to get back to the book. Can I get an amen? Amen. so important. We know the direct result of this cultural decay, broken families, divorce, abortion, crime, hatred, racism, increased poverty, greed. So how did this happen, Pastor? The vital connection between source and product affecting culture. Everything began to disconnect. Everything our creatures our creator made needs to remain connected to where it came from in order to fulfill its purpose. I cannot fulfill what God sent me here to do apart from him. I got to stay connected to him. Oh, I could be a renegade sinner and take off and preach Jesus, but it won't be long. I'll be going back to my old life again. It just happens. I got to stay connected to him. Trees from the soil, fish from the water, birds from the sky, they got to stay connected to make it and fulfill their purpose. So unless the trees stay connected to the soil, they'll pass. A seed that isn't planted can never fulfill its purpose. And you have seed. You got spiritual seed to sow to bless others. I said to the other church, I don't know if I said to you guys, one of the great ways that I diffuse evolution is this. Trees. Apples came from apple seed. Pumpkins come from pumpkin seed. You can't get a watermelon from a pumpkin seed. You only can get pumpkin from a pumpkin. Corn comes from corn seed. Whatever seed I sow, that's what I reap. Is that correct? I am a product of a seed of Marie and James Hovatter. A seed was sown and poop, there I was. Not far behind me was my brother, one year behind me. Dad wasted no time. Planting seed. You are, you're the product biologically of a seed. You got that? Listen, a rhinoceros gets with another rhinoceros. They have rhinoceros. A cow with a cow has a cow. A monkey with a monkey has a monkey. I did not come from monkeys. 
A monkey didn't sow a seed and I showed up a million late years later. Amen. I came from human seed. This is important when you understand seed time and harvest. Because a lot of people, man, they, they got this idea that we evolved. We don't evolve. You don't, you don't grow and get your hair back. You know, there are things that have left you, you ain't never getting them back. You can have all the surgery you want. Hello. We don't evolve, we devolve. We go backwards. So it's important to learn how to diffuse this whenever you're arguing with, with, with such a liberal society. Amen. Therefore, when a plant dies, it doesn't exist any longer in the form in which it can fulfill its purpose. It decays and turns back to the soil. John 15, 4, remain in me, I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The unchurched believers, my friend, they shortchange themselves and their families because they're not around to receive the help, support, and encouragement the church provides provides during tough times tv and internet they only second best to be in there i can only do so much for those that are watching us online but i can tell you right now when you're a part of a house a church a family when one hurts they all hurt when one laughs we all laugh when one gets blessed we all get blessed amen it's important to be a part of the house and i know there have been times people that may have slipped through the cracks you may have thought somebody knew who you were but but it's important to connect in this house and make family and friends so important so important you know, again, Sister Patsy Brune is passing. We know that. I've already got the message. But on the other hand, Miss Donna's here can tell me that her mother, Sister Janie, is doing better now. But how's all this possible? But we're connected to the house. Stay connected to the house. Can I get an amen? But, you know, if you're not a part of it, then you, you and, and, and please hear me, not being mean, but if you just come in and walk out, we don't know you that well. You've got to connect with a group. You've got to involve, get involved with all the meetings. Some of the meetings we have, find somebody to pester. I meet people saying, now, who was that? Well, you know, that's that dude that pesters us every morning. You know, okay, now I know who that is, Frank. I know who that is. So stay connected. You know, dropout believers also shortchange the church. The local church, the body of Christ, will remain incomplete, lacking vital ministries and gifts until those parts of the body come home again. There are those of you that were good and can be good at greeting, uh, being a part of our children's ministry, our youth ministry, uh, on, on, in the band, different places, or just providing support to all the ministries here and all the things you do. Or your unsung heroes, I call the, the, the booth back there. You work in certain areas. So important. And how many people have I met that are outside the body? And I thought to myself, my goodness, what a good musician. My goodness, what a great servant leader. My goodness, what this, this person. And they're outside. They're not helping. So we lose out because somebody's not there. That's I remember when you came in. Amen. You started get, taking initiative and doing things, driving tractors, helping us with the car. So uh, mowing, y'all mowing the grass around here. That's a, James back there in the back of the net just got baptized a couple of weeks ago. Amen. Out here taking care of grass and doing stuff. That's taking initiative. That's so important in the body. How many people, Jody, now you're involved. It's important to get connected. Can I get an amen? Oh, I, I'm, I, hope, I hope I ain't preaching to the choir. Hope somebody outside of here catches this and understands how vital. And, and I go to graves, uh, cemeteries all the time. I just something, call me morbid peaceful about me being in a cemetery very very few people stop and say hey can i talk to you i'll just wander around cemeteries and i read names and i read dates and then i'll see where someone died very young and i think to myself lord did they have the cure to cancer did they have uh, ingenuity ideas for uh, our energy crisis that could be coming. I mean, how many people have died too young or been aborted that could have been used for the kingdom of God? And I think on the outside of this house, how many people that have dropped out, disconnected, and so in my heart, i, t I got to take initiative. When I show up at a ball game, I'm taking initiative. I don't care if I go, want to go to Kroger's, I'm taking initiative. Wherever I'm going, i got to do this. i got to keep working that way. So, so why not just invite people back to church, Pastor? Let me, let me just say this about people. Whenever you try to invite people, 
This is what I get. They, they, they develop strongholds in their minds. They don't want to respond to the church anymore. They'll say, I've already been there. I've done that. They, you know, the church is just a bunch of hypocrites. Why bother? Uh, the church hurt me before. I'm not going to give them another chance. All I need is Jesus. Yeah, I, 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 I come from a family of bootleggers. I never heard one of them say, you know, drinking alcohol hurt me the other day. I'll never drink again. Hello. I don't, I never hear that. But I always hear about the church. Church hurt me. I, I won't go back. Uh, na- you know, nature is my church. Pastor, I'm fixing to get in a deer stand. I'll be with Jesus. <laughs> uh, not again that. You know, I'm going to be in a deer stand too. Hopefully one near you. If you invite me. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I have other priorities. One of my favorite things when I ask people, hey, man, uh, why don't you come to church? They'll say, I'm Baptist. <laughs> Them Baptists had got this thing down. That once saved, always saved thing, you know, I didn't got to go to church. I'm going to heaven no matter if I like it or not. <laughs> Generally speaking, you're not going to get people, dropouts, back into church just by asking them. They got strongholds. They got things to grab hold of them again. So, so what you got to be, you know, I, I talk about fishing all the time and hunting. The, the scripture talks about hunters of the harvest, Jeremiah 16, 16. Behold, I'm going to send you, send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will fish for them. And afterwards, I shall send for many hunters. And they will hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and from the clefts of the rock. In other words, wherever they have gone to, we'll find them. Now, this is important. The first is the gathering of the lost. Peter, you remember what Peter said? Simon Peter said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I let down the nets. You know the story. You've heard me preach it a lot. For those that are new here, it's, it's the casting of the net, Jesus on the boat. Uh, they fished all night, hadn't caught anything. And then he, he throws the net over, and it begins to fill up. Here's what I found out. It's important to understand that most that don't know Jesus are the fish. You gather, uh, you, you, you'll go to crusades in India and Africa, not, not, not just hundreds, thousands get saved. It's like multitudes of fish come in. It's an amazing thing. You know, when God calls you and tells you, look, throw the net, you don't want to throw it, you just got to give in to it and do what he says. God's callings are his enablings. When you've got vision, vision's important. First God gives you vision, then he gives you provision for the vision. Pro is for, pro the vision, for the vision, amen, he gives, then there's got to be supervision, somebody got to look over that vision, you can't just let stuff go, you got to look over it, you got to guard it, protect it, but watch out for division, die to division, it's important to be very careful here, two heads is not a, a, a vision can make, and if you do, you got to have a revision, come back to it, I've lived by this, I live by this, casting vision, but supervising vision. Believe in God for the provision. When we bought this church uh, six years ago, there had to be provision to, to put in the carpet and the wood and the walls and the paint and to redo everything. And it's still, we need revision. We got to redo some stuff in here. Can I get an amen? It's got to keep on happening. And, and this is important. Our pursuits are fruitless without his blessing. If I don't have the blessing of God on my life, it's fruitless. I got to have him to bless in what I do. How, how is it that people stick to church? How is it that they stick with God? Let me show you here real quick. First, involvement equals stickability. Again, these are things I've preached for years. When you get involved, you're going to stick to something. But if you don't get involved, you, you can easy in, easy out. Second, amen, stickability equals stability. The more I stick to something, the more stable I am in it. I, I, I feel good here. Most of you, when you first start coming here, you find a seat. Didn't you yet? You found a seat. Now you come back, you find that same seat. You start sticking to it. But now you're a little bit more stable. Stability is important. Stability results in productivity. Now I start producing. When you start producing, it shifts everything inside of you because you were made to produce. You were made to produce what? children. You were made to produce life. You were made to produce a future. You were made to produce a career. You were made to produce in life, to do something. And the biggest thing about productivity is that productivity equals fulfillment. I promise you this. You guys that are in, ladies have been mowing the grass around here, you feel good when it's done. It fulfills you. It does something. Yesterday, again, there I sat. And I thought to myself, why sit ye here when the grass at the church could be mowed? 
We've discussed it all week. It ain't growing. Doesn't look like it needs it. But I sat there and I thought to myself, no, nah, I think it needs it. About 6.30, I got on the mower and I headed down to the church and I mowed that churchyard. When I got done, I sat back and I looked at it and I said, whew, that looks good. When I go to the hospital and I pray for people and God blesses them, they get well. When I look over here a while ago and I saw Bryce sitting here, I remember it was a handkerchief on his cradle when, when we thought we were going to lose him when he was a little boy. And I didn't even know you two. I just went in and prayed for him because somebody said, go pray for a Burgess boy. I went in there and did that. And I look and I see him today shooting skeet, out playing football, aggravating his mom and dad. That's fulfillment. Amen. When you are fulfilled in life, you'll keep on producing. Production equals fulfillment. Keep, this is what's kept me pastoring for so long. If we ever get to a place that our churches are no longer producing, I, 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 you, you need to probably get another pastor then because I'm not doing what I'm called to do. I want to see God fulfill our lives, amen, and keep producing in our lives. Our hesitancy must give way. Uh, Lord, I've fished all night. I've worked all night. I've stayed in all night. This church ain't going to grow. There ain't nobody around here wants to be here. You can get that way, but then after a while, you just got to give in. And throw the net anyway. Everybody say throw the net. I don't care if the water's muddy. I don't care if it's Monday morning. Throw the net anyway. And when they throw the net, it filled up. You know what happened, John 21, 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net out to land full of great fish, 153 of them. They counted them. You count. And for all there were so many, yet was not one of them broken. Not one. It's amazing what God can do. Second, hunters. There's no hunters in this church. How many know we don't hunt, we shop? <laughs> no, nah, not that one, not that one. I'll take that one right there. You know, that's, that's, that's all we're doing here in Texas. And the return of, and the restoration of the believer by the hunter who tracks down each one. And this is kind of like one by one. It's one on one. It's us after Boudreaux. It's that one on one stuff. It's just so important. Matthew 18, 12. Well, how think you if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them go astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go after the, to the mountains and seeks that which one has gone astray? And just as God has taken an opportunity in our life, uh, as, you know, just as God desires the unsaved to turn to the kingdom, he desires for a dropout or unchurched or however you want to say, those near backslid to return to the kingdom of God. So fishers are for the lost, hunters hunt for the dropout. You know, we are, we're in a church that takes initiative. This church does. I'm not here beating you up. I'm here telling you and commending you. I mean, we, we, we've done banquets. We, we, we have camp volunteers. We've remodeled. We've rebuilt buildings. We have maintenance. We've dealt with visitation, child care, tornado damage, hurricane cleanup, hurricane relief, parking and feeding. Uh, I don't care if it's 1,700, 2,000 people for our car shows. Amen. We, we cooked all that, blessed them, looked after them. We, we, we greet, we seat, we care. And now we have to take the, the initiative in reaching unreached people are reconnecting people again going after them again look as, as a leader for all of us we can't just sit back and wait on the future to come we got to create it we got to make it happen inspiration of leadership again is vision vision is desire while initiative gets it accomplished initiative is the catalyst takes action springs from self-motivation self-starters and it, it begins to begin things so first listen to these principles initiative is the key to accomplishment Amen. It's a, and I may have misspelled accomplishment. Don't, don't rebuke my wife because I'm the one that writes these down. Initiative is the key to accomplishment. Uh, an inventor, composer, writers, they all think about it first. And from their imagination, it comes out. Why, why do I mow grass? Because that's where my initiative takes place. I'm thinking, matter of fact, Jos Jos Josiah, you saw me when I was leaving yesterday. He passed me, and I'm leaving the, the churchyard from over. And he stops. The first thing he looked at me and said, you're thinking about your sermon, ain't you? Because he knows that I'm on the mower, I'm thinking about what I'm going to preach, how I'm going to preach it, what I'm going to say. Initiative is so important. So in your mind, it starts bringing forth your potential. Second, initiative is the power of momentum, inertia, exertion, change, fact of life. Things don't get started once they stalled. And unless someone takes action to set them in motion again, it never happens. A train on the track takes a lot of horsepower to get it going. But once it gets going, it's rolling. Now from inertia, it's got momentum. The churches are the same way. If sometimes when a church stalls, when I was an evangelist, my job was to unstall churches. The pastor would look at me and say, Pastor, you, you got to help me out. This thing has just come to a stop. 
Nobody wants to do anything. So I would come in there with what was to them absolutely crazy thinking. Holy wild. At that time, I just got out of jail. Huh? I had a lot to talk about. Folk were getting saved. Things were happening. Amen. I, I was having more fun. In these, and next thing I know, revival would take. I went to one church in Fredericksburg, Texas. Amen. I got there. That thing was dead. Ain't nothing deader than dead church. Especially when it's called Pentecostal. Hello. Amen. When you ain't got no jumping in a Pentecostal church, when you ain't got no Bobby Pins at the altar, you got a dead Pentecostal church. So I go in there and I'm preaching. I can tell this bunch needs help. But listen, I drove from here all the way over there to preach for them. They gave me $32, I remember. It didn't even pay for the gasoline, and I invited special singers to go with me. I couldn't even give them any money. So they looked at me and I said, you know what you guys need? Y'all need reviving. Y'all need, need something to get y'all started again. And they said, we can't afford it. And I said, listen to me. You give me three nights here, I ain't worried about the money. I, I, the money don't bother me. I was an evangelist, you know, but that's how I made my living. But I went back there and gave them three nights. Watch what happened. That thing caught on fire. Kids were going out, and I know y'all don't remember this, but they had them things called cassettes. They went out to their vehicles and got their cassettes. They went out there and got their weed. They went out there and got stuff that you shouldn't be having and began to lay it at the altar. Begin just bring it in. The, the adults sat back. They couldn't believe what their teenagers were doing. Don't tell me that life is over for our teens. I believe in our teens. I believe that we're going to see resurrection among our teenagers. Amen. And they come in and just begin to lay it down. And for three nights I preached. And each night it got larger and larger and larger. There's something about getting something going. But it takes a little bit to get it going. It takes uh, frustrating sometimes and aggravating and plowing just a little bit to get some. It takes initiative to move it. But once it gets going, that thing gets to chugging, boy. And once it gets chugging, very few things can stop it. Hallelujah. It's very important. Initiative is the manifestation of decisions. Nothing can be accomplished. These are just good points. If, you're a bus if you have a business or want to start a business, you need to write these down and use them. Initiative is the manifestation of decision. Nothing can be accomplished without decision. You got to make a decision. There's some old phrases that come to mind. I can't say them in church. They're not Bible. But you've got to make a decision. You just can't sit there. If you're, if you're going to lose weight, you've got to make a decision. Two weeks ago, I made a decision. Okay, I'm shutting down fried food and bread. Whoop. Two weeks. So far. It ain't going to last. Let me say it to you. I don't want it to last. I miss chicken fried steak. I miss a big juicy cheeseburger. I miss things in my life. But right now, because I want that later, and I'm heading toward the holidays, to when if I don't do something now, I'm going to be in trouble then. So initiative started plugging it, and I said, I got to, I just made up my mind. I'm going to do this. See, it, is, it makes it a little difficult eating salads and watching somebody chomp on a cheeseburger. <laughs> Decide not to have dessert. Now do that. But, but, you, but if I want to have what I want, and again, I'm not lying to you. I'm, I'm going to eat Thanksgiving. I'm going to eat Christmas. I'm going, I'm going to eat, I'm not going to just back away. You're going to invite me. You're going to make a pie for me. Hallelujah. I ain't backing off on it. But right now, for me to enjoy it, I got to get Jerry under control. So here we go again. So you, it takes it. You, got, you can't buy a horse without making a decision. You can't buy a house without making a decision. You can't get married without making a decision. Decisions are important. That's initiative. Take it. And, and this was, oh, don't you hate this? Right after church, you husbands and wives, what should you do? You don't go eat? Yeah. Where? And you're waiting on one of them to make an initiative decision. And as the man, you should be the one making the decision. Especially if she looks at you and says, where are we going? Mr. Bill Foe. Uh-huh. Don't look back at her and say, I don't care where you want to go. Because you actually lying. You do care. Your caring has to do with how much is in your bill for. What you can't afford. How you can handle it. I love when my wife looks at me and says to me, I don't care wherever you want to go. And I start heading toward them golden arches. And all of a sudden, the manifestation of I do care comes on her. 
I don't want to go to McDonald's. Then don't tell me you don't care. And don't look at me and ask me to make a, a mandatory decision because I might make one without you. Initiative. Initiative, my friend. Initiative is the key to pleasing leadership. Initiative is the key to pleasing leadership. If you are a parent, a guardian, a grandparent, or even if you own a dog, you are a leader. And when that dog, child, or employee does something out of the blue on an initiative, it pleases you. You didn't ask for it. It just happened. When that child decides to wash your car and you didn't ask for it, they just took initiative. It pleases you. As a pastor, when people take the initiative, they don't have to ask me if it's something good. You know, I'm, I'm out here talking to my pastor on the phone, and here come Mike Feast down there to get my Bible and my book. I never once asked Mike to come down and get my Bible or book. He takes initiative. Sam and them gets up in the morning, comes in here, opens the building. Air conditioner, they take initiative. There are people mowing the grass, they take an initiative. That pleases leadership. They ain't nothing like that. I walked into a meeting Thursday uh, to a, a pastor's a ministerial alliance meeting, greeted a family at a restaurant there and said hi to them, went back there and met with them preachers. And when it was over, the waiter comes and looks at me and says, somebody done paid y'all's meal. All them preachers look over at me. Because, you know, I, I sure wasn't one of their members. I didn't know for sure if it was one of ours. I slid my phone up under that desk, and I punched a thank you to a family that was in there. And they texted me back and said, we just want to make you proud, Pastor. And I'm standing at the table smiling. Somebody took initiative. You see what I'm saying? Initiative is so important in life. And whenever you take initiative, it pleases parents, it pleases employers, it, it, it pleases leadership to take initiative, just to do that. That is so important. And when, I want to tell you something. When I get done with my second service, a young teenager will come and get my bag and get my keys and take it out to my truck. Not one time did I ask them to do that. It's taking initiative. And I see it over and over in this house. When you have initiative and now to reconnect with people, to go after them. Initiative is the manifestation of the spirit of confidence and faith. It's saying we can do this thing. I believe, matter of fact, the scripture got a rebuke for us, but my righteous one will live by faith. Faith. You no, know, I don't always see it, but I know it's going to happen. I believe God is going to happen. I'm holding on to it. But, but, and if he shrinks back, you ever seen anybody with the shrinks? I said, you ever seen anybody with the shrinks? One translation says slips. If they slip back, I will not be pleased with him. I thought about preaching a message. Of course, it does, it's, not, it's not applicable today. It was 25 years ago. If I used the phrase, excuse me, your slip's showing. Huh? Huh? Yeah, some of you, yeah, a long time ago. I, again, 20 years ago when it was applicable. If I say now, you, excuse me, your slip's showing, husband look at wife and say, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? What do you mean, excuse me, your slip is showing? <laughs> That's funny. But now if you shrink. And I, I look at people sometimes. I watch them slip back. And, and I'm nervous for them, afraid for them, scared for them. It ain't the fact you ain't in church. It's the fact you're walking away from God. Look, you won't leave this church to go to another church. I'm cool with that. <laughs> Why don't you just give me a heads up and let me know? But until then, I don't know what you're doing. So you slip back. You shrink back. You're not pleasing God. You got an opportunity to eat vomit, water in the mire. Initiative. Let me go to the next last point here. Initiative is the spirit of creativity. You keep trying until it yields the right, result, right results. You just keep on trying. You stay at it. You don't give up. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times each time he gets back up. Give, some, give folk time to get back up. I, and I, don't ever condemn somebody just walked away. Amen. Don't ever do that. But take an opportunity to look at them, be compassionate toward them, and realize it could have been you. And it may have been you before. Initiative is the key to obedience. Do it now. 
David, I want you to help me. H, if I get your help, amen. Now, listen to me. Let me see just one of those. This week, while I'm mowing and running around, I get to thinking about people who are disconnected, no longer with us. And I wrote a prayer. Lord, I bring my friend to you who once walked with you. I pray you put a hedge of protection around them. Do whatever it takes to reconnect them back to you. Lead them to a Bible-believing church. I don't care if it's this church or where. Lead them to a Bible-believing church and renew their passion. In Jesus' name, amen. What I'm saying is, is that I have people that I'm connecting with right now, even family. I'll, I'll spend money, I'll do whatever it takes to get them reconnected, to see them find a place of worship. And if this is the best they got, is internet, okay. All right. I have, we have people that are, the term is shut in. They're unable to get out. They're taking care of their mamas and their daddies. And this is their connection. But they got a connection through us. They can call us, reach out to us. But either way, we want to connect to them. But on this card, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody here that wants one, two cards. On one card, you write the name of one, two, three, however many people you want. I don't want an address. I don't want a phone number. I want you to write a name. On the second card, write the same thing. Then take a card and put it in your pocket. Drop the other card in the offering bucket when it goes around. And what we're going to do, David and I, Joseph, the rest of our staff, each day we in service, at, uh, each, each morning out at the ranch, without going through it, we're going to take that bundle of names and we're going to pray over them. And we're going to believe God to put a Holy Ghost hook in that jaw. We're going to believe God to hunt them down. And if we're going to ask God for divine appointments, that there are names on there that we're going to connect with and you're going to connect with. Because the Bible says this in the book of Matthew, that if we agree on any one thing, if two people, if I get just two people, you know, God never said three, four, five. He took it as low as he could go. and said, if I could just get two, you not his. Just two to agree on any one thing, it'll be done. You know why some marriages never get anything done? They never agree on anything. Agree on it. Here's what I, uh, we remodeled our home. You know what I agreed with? 98% of everything Lori wanted. You know what got done? Everything. Ain't no need fighting over it. Especially when I don't care. I don't care what color that wall is. I don't care what that fan looked like. I don't care what that bed going to be. The only thing I care about is a glass of tea and that chair with my dog watching football. Just get me there and I'm fine. The rest of it you can have. That was the 1% that I agreed on. <laughs> I know all of you ain't got an ink pen, but I promise you there's somebody near you that does. And if you need someone, we can bring from the back. If you need one of these, go ahead, guys. Uh, matter of fact, could I get two more guys to take half of these and go halfway back so we can speed this up just a little bit? Again, one card's for you, one's for somebody else. Now look, if you don't know anybody who's a who's, uh, 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 drop out or, or, or away from God, it's okay. God bless you. If you don't care about them, well, God bless you. I'm glad you're here in church today. But I'd like to pray for them. I'd like to pray for people. I'd like to see what God's going to do. So write a name down. Again, I don't need an address. I don't need a phone number. I don't need to be nosy. I'm just going to wrap them in a rubber band and pray over them. If there's ink pens back in the back, if y'all know of some somewhere, somebody needs one, sing a song, Josiah.
one reason we wrote a prayer on that card is because I know there are times you say, I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. The book of Ephesians is full of written prayers that Paul wrote. And if you read his books, he wrote prayers. He wrote them out for you to pray. So we wrote this prayer out to help you out. You can pray anything you want. But this is the prayer we're going to pray each morning. We ask God to put a hedge around them and bring them back. Amen. Would it be? Isn't it going to be great? Don't say would it be. Let's say isn't it going to be great? When God brings people back into the house, reconnects them to the body, the vitality. If I get our servant leaders to come up, I'm just going to say a few more brief things before David comes. Early 1900s, pastor of a small church. You know, the smaller the church, the easier it is to notice when somebody's gone. A man with a hurt in his heart left the church. A few months had passed, and the pastor didn't know how to deal with it. One night, God spoke to the preacher, just go to his house. It was a cold winter night. The pastor went to the house, knocked on the door. The man allowed him to come in. Without a word, they sat there and stared at the fire in the fireplace. The man waiting to receive condemnation from the preacher about missing church, and going back to his old lifestyle. The preacher didn't say anything. Time passed and the preacher took the tongs. He reached into the fireplace and he pulled out a hot coal. And he set it there on the concrete beside the fireplace. And both men just stared at it. Glowing red and then it began to fade into a charcoal gray into darkness. The man stopped rocking his rocking chair and looked at the preacher and said, I get it now. I understand. I'll see you Sunday. It's important to stay connected. Amen. If you need to tie the offering envelope, honor the king today with your giving. 